When you're an adult, truth or dare is just called court. <laughs> God. <laughs> Welcome to Casuals of Runeterra, part three of our Star Guardian special. I'm your host, Ryan, here with your other host, Hedge. Uh, part three of More to Come To, because boy, are we getting some Star Guardian content now. <laughs> Listen, it's, I think everyone in the League of Legends content creation community is dreading <laughs> the amount of like the floodgates are open. So let's just get into it. Um, Housekeeping up top. Let's get out of the way. You can listen to us everywhere, and we appreciate that. Uh, contact us at podcastcore at gmail.com, and then you can visit us at podcastcore.com for all of our info. Uh, follow us on any platform you prefer. We're on most of them or all of them. Uh, and then leave us a like, comment, or a short review. But the easiest way, as we recommend, is word of mouth. Tell a friend to do that thing they do by listening <laughs> to the Casuals of Runeterra podcast. You did not. <laughs> I did. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, so uh, with this being part three, uh, obviously we just covered over our first uh well, the first big story in the Star Guardian universe, uh, and we introduced a whole new team into uh, the world of Star Guardians. So no, instead of our original five members, we got five more people to talk about. So uh, I'm going to steal Ryan's thunder and say we're going to talk about some bios real quick. Who are these five new members? Well, not members to the group, but there's five new people of Star Guardians that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, yeah. So at this point... If you're here listening, you know, welcome. You made it to part three. But if you haven't and you're starting on this episode, stop. Go back and listen to part one and two. Because in part one, we cover the original bios and then for the OG group that we know. And then for part two, we went to one of the major stories uh, for the interactions that introduced this group we're talking about now. So for this one, the plan is to talk about the bios and then talk about what seems to be what would be like a... OVA episode of an anime. <laughs> it's like a side episode that has some stuff in there that matter, but it's more just for the funsies. So we'll talk about that today. Yeah. Th and this then is, we'll talk about what's coming yeah, in the next part. OVA is perfect because if like as far as like American media, this would be like that TV like hour long special in between the seasons <laughs> to be like, hey, what happened during this break? And, and it's like, oh, they're just having fun. Oh, wait. There is some stuff happening that's important. Okay, we gotta we gotta pay attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gives us some progress. But we're gonna go to the five girls, like um, Hetch mentioned, five girls. <laughs> I'll clarify that. <laughs> Sorry, Ezreal. <laughs> As they say in the story, oh, and you too, Ezreal. <laughs> so. We start with the leader of this group, which is Ari. And as we found out in part two, uh, Ari is a veteran, right? She's been around the block a couple times and she's done a couple battles. And we also get a faint hint that she has lost members in the past, which has kind of molded the Ari that we get to see where she's charismatic. People are naturally drawn to her, but she's kind of like stone. She's not really... She doesn't mix words. She's very straightforward. And even though she would, you would think, oh, maybe she, there's a bubbly personality in her there. She's all business, right? She almost reminds me of like Poppy. Yeah, like much more like uh, Poppy as far as comparing it to the original five members. Um, and that, like, with that, like the direct quote from her bio that I think is like sums it up perfectly, which is tough love is all that's left. Um, so it's like, yeah, almost like borderline cynicism at this point. But um, with her magical medium, we have the spirit Kiko, um, which one look at the picture if you haven't pulled up these bios before, because Kiko is adorable. Um, but Kiko is kind of almost like a foil to Ari in essence, because uh, Kiko is the embodiment of her charisma and sass. So 
the a lot of Kiko's mannerisms and actions around other Star Guardians is almost like flamboyant. Uh, like it's very outgoing and extroverted, despite the fact that no one but Ari can understand Kiko. Uh, but it's very different from Ari because, again, Ari's a you know grizzled veteran and she's just seen too much shit to care anymore. <laughs> so uh, Kiko is kind of the foil to her in that regard. Yeah, and this kind of leads us into the next person who's also a veteran, which is Miss Fortune or Sarah Fortune. Um, and she has kind of similar uh, traits about her. And this is kind of what makes this is what makes it interesting, because now we want to know what happened, <laughs> because they're both like hardened veterans, like Hetch mentioned, and they have that part of Poppy that's very determined to get shit done. Um, but unlike uh Ari misfortune doesn't really have the charisma aspect everyone kind of just kind of stays away from her right um in the social situations we've had so far she definitely has some heat to her uh but she's just as determined as she is to do what they're meant to do they don't like the flowery words like destiny and all that stuff but they know what job needs to be done the one aspect we get here though that's unique to this group is that she has kind of a weariness about Syndra and we'll get to Syndra towards the end, um, where she, because of them losing former teammates, the new teammates she gets, she doesn't really get as close to anymore. And Syndra being a very unique situation makes that even more so. So that's an inter interesting dynamic here. Um, and instead of really chiming in on that, it's more of just like looking at the Syndra aspect, because this is like, for the case of our show, it's the second mention that we've got of a lot of doubt surrounding Syndra, because if you've listened to our part two uh, Star Guardian episode, the only time that we ever really saw a change in Jana's demeanor was upon you know, talking to Syndra yeah. and then seeing that Syndra was a part of Ari's group. So there's definitely a lot kind of going on under the surface there. And the fact that Misfortune's bio even calls out on it too, is like, oh, hey, we're not, we're not crazy for noticing it. Uh, but that takes us something's to funky. Something's real funky. Uh, <laughs> that takes us to a uh, Boki and Baki, which are the two magical mediums for Misfortune. Uh, and they are twins that are born of misfortune's desire for vengeance. Yeah. Um, despite the fact that they're born from vengeance, they also are super adorable. And apparently they are very like fun and playful as far as a dynamic to everyone on the outside looking in. But they're cold, cold stone killers. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of weird that they are as adorable and playful as they are. Yeah, they're very similar to Jinx's mediums. Yeah, um, absolutely. In that sense. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that's why the redheads. The <laughs> <laughs> head said that I did it. Ah! Okay. So all you redheads up there. Yeah. Uh, you can call out Ryan about it at podcast core at gmail.com. <laughs> um, so the next one is Soraka. So Soraka for this group is their Lulu essentially. Obviously she's older, um, but it's also mentioned, which I thought was interesting that she's from a mysterious origin among the stars. And this is something we haven't touched on, and we'll talk about later when we have more time, about different species, right? Like, you have girls who are obviously yordles, um, you have Soraka being who she is, um, and even her appearance here still has some traits from her original form. So I, I don't know, if we'll get to if that's explained later down the road. But it's just mentioned here, so that's why I'm bringing it up, that she comes I, from a mysterious background. Yeah, like, I, I'm I'm curious more about the mysterious background because, like, it does seem like they're trying to keep this in the world of Terra and almost like a multiverse kind of thing because, you know, like, in our part two took place in Targon. Yeah. Like, not necessarily it was like, yeah, because it was called Camp Targon, which sounded cute and everything, but they even mentioned that it's under the peak of Mount Targon. Yeah. Like, they can see Mount Targon in the background. So I wonder if this is just like a parallel universe where it's more, you know, akin to our universe as far as, like, the way that civilization developed, but they're still living alongside yordles and mythical creatures. So it's like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like, if there's interplay, this is a Star Trek-type situation, right, where you have inner species. Like, no matter where they go, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's species from all over the place that live on these different planets. But 
Soraka is just as kind of she's quieter than Lulu, um, but has that same innocence to her, same humbleness, uh, and kind of just loving life, right? And enjoys being around people and enjoys being around groups. And the difference between her and Lulu, though, is Lulu's connection to the first light, the first star's light, is very understood in her mind, and it's a, like it's a good connection, right? She's not going through a tunnel. Soraka, on the other hand, is kind of in between that, where she has some connection to that directly, but she doesn't have complete control over that communication. Right. Like she, she's trying to learn what this connection even is. Yeah. Whereas Lulu gets it, but Lulu's also just an energetic child. So everyone is just kind of like, uh, are you all there? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this takes us to Soraka's medium, who is Shisa. Um, and uh, Shisa is grumpy and overprotective. So once again, we've got like another foil to... Uh, someone's character but uh, for for Soraka she says developed this way because of Soraka's innocent nature and she tends to be more naive uh, than a lot of other people and she uh, became very overprotective of her and trying to be someone to save her from herself so uh, despite its very cute appearance it constantly keeps like a scowl on its face yeah because it's just like no no no, nope. it's it's the Do poppy of mediums, the poppy of mediums. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so this takes us to Syndra, who is one of the most interesting ones, considering what we've had so far. And it's mentioned that she's from an earlier era. Now, using the word era is very specific here uh, because that can be a long time ago um, and from unknown origins. And they relate it to kind of Jana's background. But the problem is that Jana, like Soraka's situation doesn't really have a solid memory of her past, right? Of things that happened. Where if Syndra does have that, it's probably what makes people uncomfortable is she's choosing to hide it from people. And then her behavior around her team is also questionable where she's very persistent to get things done by any means necessary. And Ari trusts her, right? Uh, but that doesn't stop the rest of the team from kind of questioning her, what her goal is at the end of the day. Yeah. And th this is why she ends up kind of building doubt between the people that become closest to her is because she keeps her cards held to her chest. Yeah. Um, and you can't really trust someone if they don't open up to. So it, it and you throw that into a party that's led by very cynical people. Uh, and it's going to, it's going to build a lot of tension, but uh, well, that takes us to the magic medium multi. So multi is a triple manifestation of Syndra's star guardian power. Um, and the, as far as like in the bio, it says that they represent an array of emotions. I, I want to try to chime in more on this. This is really in my book just feels like a, an excuse to be like, um, yeah, Syndra uses balls. Uh, to attack in game and she can summon three at a time if she doesn't use her ultimate so uh yeah they're multi done we we've done it uh th yeah. this one this one feels a little uh uh kind of just let's ship it <laughs> yeah it feels feels on the nose right um and this takes us to ezreal who they just copy and pasted ezreal what? Uh, yeah let's talk about on the nose <laughs> if you listen to part two you're just dealing with normal ezreal at this point um, but he is the newest member of the group and got his light later uh, in life. And then has he's still an adventurer in this form of the story. He kind of likes to do his own thing, uh, but he's always supportive of the group. And the main thing that I think about him is he's the direct connection that we get to the new group. Because without Ezreal, who's essentially the kindest person to the new girls, um, when they meet, you would lose the opportunity to have these teams interact and intermingle. And when we talk about our story today, we'll go further into that. Yeah. And like, it, it's kind of weird how much of Ezreal's like stories copy and pasted to make him a star guardian, because yeah. when you read his bio, he doesn't even feel like he's in an alternate universe. No, It, it feels like it's just Ezreal 
except now he's a star guardian in the normal Runeterra universe, and he looks around and goes, ah, I'm in the wrong one. I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Um, Which kind of fits, because he can hop through portals, right? In different, yeah, like he's, he, can, he, he has multi-dimensional abilities uh, in this like, universe. <laughs> do you know how crazy, do you know how crazy it would be if, like, they turn Ezreal into the Doctor Strange of the Runeterra or universe? The Flash, yeah. And not Zillion? Like Zillion is not the Doctor Strange; it just somehow becomes Ez- Wait, he, Ezreal. You, steals it from Zillion. Are you hinting at Star Guardian Zillion, the oh. oldest member? God, I, I signed, I signed an NDA. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> um, now, uh, with uh, his mag- with Ezreal's magical medium, uh, Yuto. Uh, this is Yuto is really a copy pasta of Ezreal too. Like yeah. Yuto. Is not a foil to his character. Yuto has the same desires as Ezreal, except that he tends to be a little more shy, so he just hides inside Ezreal's gauntlet. Um, and but it is mentioned here that Yuto can fly and is often used as a scout, which is really weird that they decided to do this because it's like, oh well, that's a Quinn thing yeah both in bio and in gameplay which would have been me fishing for an idea like a couple days ago but at the time of recording we now are getting more details about the star guardians and quinn's gonna show up so it's like what <laughs> why'd y'all do this right <laughs> because we got to sell these skins never forget the goal <laughs> as we do all this lore for you we get it all right we still love the lore let's do this thing so This takes us to the Slumber Party Summoning. And we promise this isn't as long as part two. This one's a brisk run through, and we're gonna hit all the points that kind of matter here. But as always, a good story in three parts. We start with part one, where the story starts with Lux slamming the front door in the faces of some of the other guardian, a star guardian group. Uh, She doesn't really know why they're at the door, but she's panicking because we've established in the previous episode, she has anxiety. We're just going to say that she has anxiety. A (laughs) hundred (laughs) percent. And after she does that, she looks at Lulu, who's at her feet, and she's like, why are they here panicking? And Lulu mentions, you said there was a Star Guardian Council meeting, and it was mandatory. And she's like, yeah, but for our group, like, we just met them. <laughs> like, I have control over my team. And now, like everything else, I'm constantly learning. I don't have control over my team. <laughs> so the last thing I need is more PayPal. <laughs> so Lulu obviously ignores that. Excited, opens the door, and outside is an annoyed misfortune, smiling Ezreal, and a quiet Soraka. And Lulu just goes and pulls them in and welcomes them to the Star Guardian sleep over party yay and this is where we get you know again we mentioned ovas from a lot of different animes this is clearly the ova setup of just like yeah uh, we are defenders of the galaxy we save it from cosmic threats that are too big for humans to understand but we want to have a slumber party yeah they're humans too yeah, who are yeah. humans too? I, I think I, we think they're <laughs> who knows? Who, who even knows anymore? We're only in part three, okay? Maybe in part like seventeen, we'll be able to dig deeper. Wait, the... we can't even say that. Soraka's in Lulu and Poppy are at this party. <laughs> they're not even human. <laughs> so this takes us to part two here, where all the you know all the meat happens. So they sit awkwardly in the living room for a long time after they get them in there and then Ezra is kind of the first one to break the silence which he's kind of the guy who can handle awkward situations the best and he asks if there's something they do often right like do they do this to they always have sleepovers they always have these kind of gatherings because the idea we're getting from like we mentioned the personalities of the other veteran group is that they're not as close niche and because of Ari's past because of misfortune's past we know that makes sense uh, and misfortune after he says that kind of scoffs because like what kind of team has sleepovers right uh and which is great as far as this scoff because again uh lux is a high overachieving high school student yeah. with anxiety so someone that she perceives as cooler than she is has scoffed at something that lux likes to do therefore her world has grumbling and crashing down around her (laughs) hashtag anxiety so 
so after um they say yeah we do this and poppy kind of backs them up as yeah we like to have this kind of fun right we're a family kind of thing I, and as i do i do love poppy's interjections here because this is like gives a more light-hearted uh look at poppy's you know like rigid black and white view yeah. of the world which is you know the slumber parties are things that we do i enjoy them i enjoy braiding hair so yes <laughs> so oh completely oblivious to reading the room completely oblivious to how awkward everyone is oblivious to misfortune scoffing at their childish ideas and oblivious to how lux is just like this is my nightmare poppy is like yes we braid hair it's fun. <laughs> Come do it with us. <laughs> and this makes Lux upset, right? Because she's not reading the room. And the cool kids mentality of once again, she's stuck in the presence of them is just crumbling around her. Uh, and now she has this in her thing in her mind where she's like, oh, shit, they think we're homebodies. And homebodies are lame, right? We don't go out and have fun. Um and when they ask if, you know, ask Ezreal, do you guys do that? And Ezreal mentions that Ari kind of prefers to be out and about other people. So that, once again, re, uh, reinforces that she goes and does stuff, but not usually with the group. Right. And, but, uh, you know, Lux has anxiety. She can't actually, she's not, doesn't know these details because, like we discussed in part one, Ari very much keeps Lux at arm's length because Ari's aware that more star guardians means more problems. Yeah. So she, <laughs> she has not told Lux about her past. Lux has not told Lux about these dangers. And Lux is just trying to like grasp at all of this just from her own anxiety. So she doesn't get that. That's why this is happening. And that's why Ari's so standoffish. She can only see it as Ari so much cooler than me and I'm yeah. a loser. And that's why <laughs> I am not out and about with other people. Yeah. So Soraka kind of speaks up for the first time. And I think every part we've done so far, <laughs> but yes. she asked, uh, is Jinx going to be joining us? And then, you know, Miss Fortune gets some jabs in there about Jinx's behavior and demeanor. And then naturally at that point, that's Jinx's cue. She bursts through the door and being fashionably late. And she has a bag full of her mediums and a bag full of fireworks. And that's a problem because they're indoors. <laughs> what, what do you mean a problem? Like you say that's a problem because they're indoors. <laughs> Jinx is like, you know, now they're contained. So that we can actually get a front row seat to the explosion <laughs> instead of wasting it a hundred feet in the sky. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I love how she enters and she's wearing sunglasses and <laughs> Lux points out it's nighttime. Like it's it's not that it became dark as she got here. It's been dark the whole time. <laughs> yep. I, I wear my sunglasses at night. <laughs> <laughs> well and, and lux mentions that jinx likes to make an entrance like what more way of an entrance can you make than showing up in the middle of the night wearing sunglasses with a bag full of fireworks i, I think that covers all of your entrance spaces can't do it in your own home where can you do it <laughs> <laughs> so jinx shows up she obviously it's kind of like record scratch room stops as she walks in and now she has all everybody's attention that's something she likes and, you know, MF is kind of continues to point out how lame this is. She's on her phone doing her own thing. Uh, and then Lux tries to play it cool as if, well, you know, we don't have to do the slumber party thing. We can just do the meeting part because you guys are Star Guardians. We're Star Guardians. We're serious. You guys are serious. Let's have a serious meeting. And even that doesn't get her attention. Like, she's still uninterested. And naturally, because Jinx is chaos, she suggested, hey, let's play an exciting game, which turns out to be truth or dare. Yep, uh, which, I mean, as far as with this, like, that's kind of still in the vein of the slumber party thing, because uh, other members are showing that they do this often and that they have fun doing it. Yeah. But truth or dare is the perfect way to get, you know, hormonal high schoolers just on the edge of their seats and tense. <laughs> so, like, this is this is something that does actually catch everyone's attention. So, they, you don't have to worry about misfortune looking at her phone anymore lux just enjoy the anxiety of oh god what are my friends going to ask misfortune <laughs> yeah when you're an adult truth or dare is just called court uh, god <laughs> <laughs> which is just as anxious but okay so <laughs> i digress 
So she immediately says, okay, we're playing truth or dare, goes to Ezreal, and she's like, okay, truth or dare. And he's like, truth. And she's like, do you like Lux? Straight up, right? To make it as awkward as possible. Kind of leaves him speechless. And then Jonna actually butts in and just says truth as well, right? And the new referee comes to, to play, which is Poppy. And because of course out. it is. Yeah. So Poppy's like, okay, well, it's it's his it's her turn to go, right? She has to answer a question. So Jinx is upset and she has to turn her attention. Um, or sorry, Poppy. Wait. I'm so lost. because like Jinx didn't even ask Ezreal truth or dare, and Ezreal did not respond. Jinx oh, just sorry. outright yeah. was like, let's play truth or dare. So Ezreal, truth. Oh. She Jinx, Jinx said says, truth. Yeah, Ezreal, sorry. truth. Do you like Lux? Yeah. And then and then it is Jonna that jumps in and goes, Truth. And Poppy's like, Well, Jonna volunteered to go first. So Jonna will go first. Okay. And, I misunderstood that interaction. Yeah. So it, like that's that's what happens there. But I mean, it, it's more of a thing of just like, you know, Jinx is trying to put Ezreal one on the spot and then two, be the overprotective friend of like, you know, get away from my best friend. Um, yeah. I'll, or I'll fight you. Uh, but this opens up like the floor to truth or dare. So we get as far as like with Jonna, you know, where Jonna's question, uh, this kind of starts opening the door to like what's going on behind the scenes that we are a part of the universe that we're still learning. Cause mm -hmm. we know Jonna has, is a more veteran member and has a lot more memories than some of the other members of what it's like to be a star guardian. So the question that's asked is, is it true that you are older than Poppy's hammer? Yeah. Uh, and we know Poppy's hammer is her, you know, her mystic guide, but it's also been around longer than Poppy. So the, it's like, you remember before us, like how old are you actually, how deep does all this go? And Jonna just simply says, no, it's false. I am not, not that old. I'm not that old. And then and Jinx is like, what, really? And, and then it's like, oh, no, that's not how it works. You don't ask more questions. Cuts in Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> now it's now it's Jonna's turn to pick someone to ask a question. Yeah. So and, then she, and she picks, picks Soraka. Yep. Um, and then, you know, Soraka picks Truth. And this is, a, well, you know, we said there's some things in here that actually matter. This matters because they ask, can you remember a time when the first light was whole? And it's one of those things where she's like, yeah, sort of, right? Because as we mentioned in her bio, it's scattered, right? That communication piece between what was and what is. Yeah, and the way that it's put here is that Soraka is just like, yeah, I remember. Yeah. And everyone's just kind of staring at her like, holy crap, that's ridiculous. And her response to that is just, what, y'all can't? <laughs> and uh, Soraka is not nearly as, you know, as bubbly of a personality as Lulu. Like, we get the vibe that, you know, Soraka is kind of just as anxious as Lux in ways. Yeah. So then Soraka is kind of taken aback because it's like what should i not be remembering all this yeah i thought we all remembered this and it kind of opens a door to you know this idea of like okay well what do y'all remember and here comes poppy going no 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 you don't ask the this whole group the of questions yeah. that's not the game so it's like you know we're still playing a game you have to play the game right you pick someone else and so soraka is like oh, okay swallows down those questions that she has and she picks Ezreal. <laughs> so now it's Ezreal's time for truth or dare. But we know Ezreal. He's not gonna ask, ask for truth. <laughs> Ezreal says dare, baby. It's time to change the pace. And just a quick thing on that whole interaction. So it's funny because remember originally Lux wanted to have a serious meeting. And during all these little parts of this game, there are serious questions being asked, <laughs> but none of them are getting answered because that's not how the game works. <laughs> yeah. So I can imagine that Lux is just like anxious ridden in the corner watching all this happen and just like, what the fuck? It, I, I like to imagine it as like her kind of being like borderline neurodivergent of just like, <laughs> of like we're so close to getting what I want. Uh, of which is answering these questions but like no one's allowing these questions to be answered because of a stupid game <laughs> like 
<laughs> and also being like, but we're playing a stupid game, so that means they're going to hate us even more because we're not talking about the serious stuff. Uh, um, <laughs> one thing yes. we're going to hate, though, is Ezreal because he says one of the corny... Listen, we had some corny lines in part two. This, I think, beats it. <laughs> and I don't know what we're going to have in part four. Yeah. But um, as they're going back and forth and it's Ezreal's turn... He kind of lays back, puts his arms behind his heads, and he says, ladies, please, there's enough adventure to go around. Now, listen to me. <laughs> Writers, he didn't have to do this. There is somebody who, your editor saw this. <laughs> Unless you edited it yourself, which I don't approve of. <laughs> but that is a ridiculous line. <laughs> Oh God! He, I, I mean, it's enough adventure to go around. It, it's even funnier because it's also just like it's not that good of a line, and it's clearly just to be like, "Well, this is how Ezreal talks." Mm -hmm. Because it's like, who needs a map? Um, <laughs> so Ezreal's not going to say there's enough of him to go around. He's going to say enough adventure because he's an adventurer, and it's just like, oh God, stop. Um, but yeah, uh, we get to Ezreal picking Dare, and Soraka dares Ezreal to do that thing you do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, which, you know, gets an eyebrow from everyone else, and, and it's like, oh, and Ezreal's then like, what thing I do? I do a lot of things. I, I breathe. <laughs> I, I talk. And it's like, oh, you know, the thing with the portal. And Ezreal's like, oh, yeah, cool. I could totally do that. And... That's when he gets his backpack, pulls out his gauntlet, and says, hey, buddy, it's time to wake up. Yeah. And we get Yuto, his familiar, popping out. And they do a Ezreal, fusion dance. Yeah, Ezreal and Yuto <laughs> do uh, the Dragon Ball fusion dance. Uh, so in he, using a portal, Ezreal creates the illusion that, you know, him and Yuto have become one being, and he's got wings, and then uses a portal to blip over Lulu's head to grab a paper fortune teller out of her hands and then reappear back where he was with the paper fortune teller. So, you know, as far as the way that it's written out, this is a very, like, this is a very um, kind of parlor trick scene. You know, it's meant to be very innocent and very simple. But this whole time that we've been playing this game, Lulu's been in her own world counting out the paper fortune teller yeah. as far as with the number that Miss Fortune picked, which was a ridiculously high number and like 200 <laughs> or something. And we know that Lulu is a very one, a very whimsical being, but all, two very connected to all this cosmic yeah. world around them. And so not only does she have this fortune maker, Lu Ezreal takes it from Lulu, the most connected member to the first star through a portal. Yeah, you remember, oh, so if you've listened to our Annie episode, we talked about magic leaking and magic interacting with each other. Yes. So it, you know what we're getting at with that statement. But the one thing I want to mention as well with him sprouting the wings, that kind of gives us an explanation. So in part two, there's a scene where he throws Lux up in the air, right? And we're wondering, how did he do that? Well, it's because he can do this wing move with his familiar. Um, and that was cool to see them integrate that here, right? One of the small things that matters. But when he grabs it from her, takes it through the portal and opens it to finally reveal the fortune, it says only in darkness can the light shine brightly. And they're asking, where did you hear that? Because the previous one he opened, Poppy made it known that that was from a fortune cookie. <laughs> so where'd you get this one? And she says that the first star told her that that was important. And that kind of fits, obviously, the lore we've been telling you about light versus darkness. Yeah. And it also goes back to the conversation that they, well, the game they were playing with Soraka mentioning that she still has memories of that. Yeah. So the uh, the veteran members kind of look at Lulu and they kind of chime in that, uh, you know, it's like, hang on a second. This is connected as far as like to Soraka you know, he's still remembering those memories and we do not have any direct access to the first star. So this is Lulu's reveal to the veterans that she does still commune with the first star. 
and the when they're trying to get an idea of like hey um like you still talk to the first star none of us can hear the first star what does that mean Ezreal then is like um before we discuss that she can talk to the first star uh we may need to get rid of this and he meant <laughs> holding the paper the 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 fortune little fortune teller paper game he's like we may need to get rid of this and now the paper game one is starting to turn black and two is moving yeah. and then everyone is now putting together like oh right he went through a portal to someone who is connected directly to the first star <laughs> <laughs> And then it's like, did uh, I, I like the uh, the question that Jinx says is, did you bring an annoying interdimensional hitchhiking demon into Lux's living room using your not a portal portal power? <laughs> it has real. I might have. <laughs> and it's funny because he also mentions that he may have done this before. And when he says before, he means like six or seven times. So he knows <laughs> something was going to go wrong, but he couldn't help himself with the dare. And immediately we have somebody snap in action, which is Poppy goes to try to smash it. And she ends up just destroying the coffee table instead, uh, but misses it completely. And then Jana begins using wind magic indoors. Remember, we have fireworks, we have guns, we have wind, we have magic, we have portals. This is all happening inside of a house. That is bad. It's not where you do these things. Yep, and this is like now becoming a thing where you've got like essentially a bunch of trained interdimensional demon killers all chasing a very tiny little <laughs> demon inside of a living room with very, very strong superpowers. And so we've got this chaotic scene going about while everyone's using these giant weapons to try to destroy a mosquito. Yeah. And it ends in this quick little stare down of Lux and misfortune with Lux staring down the barrel of one of misfortune's guns and misfortune's like time to say goodbye and Lux is now just like one all the anxiety that it oh was yeah she's still in hell up. she's in hell this whole time all the anxiety that was building up for her <laughs> is like oh this is why it was building up because they're destroying my house now <laughs> and I'm about to die because I'm staring <laughs> down a gun and she's saying time to say goodbye. And with a loud pop, like a pop of a balloon, a, the paper fortune teller just explodes into confetti as Miss Fortune shoots it and kills it. And then, of course, we've got this scene of, you know, of Jinx being like, hey, nice shot. And then he's like, yeah, now it's a party. So, you know, straight up the quote from Jinx in game. It's like, now it's a party. And then it's going to another quote while Lux is realizing that she is still alive, but also still on the verge of death because of her anxiety. We then have another direct quote of the game with Jinx, which is smells like burning. <laughs> and Lux goes, oh, no dinner <laughs> yeah and that's right we're now now we can calm down a bit because this demon's been destroyed but that's right my f dinner was in the oven and now yeah. it's ruined and this was alluded to through the whole story because she never got a chance to take her oven mitts off like from the moment she went to the door she talked about her hands sweating in these oven mitts that she still has on because everything's happening so quickly so in the you know the third part of this story is her rushing into this kitchen it's filled with dark smoke it's obvious the dinner's burnt. She takes it out, and immediately the waterworks start, right? This is part two. I lost the map all over again. <laughs> She's starting to <laughs> weep, and she hears kind of footsteps coming in the kitchen. She's thinking it's going to be, you know, Ezreal and probably Soraka or Jana to kind of console her. It turns out to be misfortune, which is very surprising. Um, and now she's crying, but also, as we've seen her before, when she's nervous, she starts to talk. And it's just a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. So we now have this scene of, you know, misfortune. Like she's Lux is trying to be like almost guarded while also being very vulnerable in this moment. And then it's like, okay, well, I 
I've got to say something. So the rambling starts with, you know, I'm so sorry that Lulu dragged you into this. I'm sorry that dinner got ruined. Yeah. Uh, and I, I totally get it. If you want to leave, I, if you never want to see us again, I understand that too. Blah, 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 blah. And then misfortune. Build those walls. Build yeah. those walls. <laughs> uh, misfortune doesn't say anything. Misfortune's yeah. just kind of staring at her like, uh, you know, let her, let her get it out. Yeah. And Lux realizes, oh God, I'm rambling. And she goes, so then she's like, uh, Fortune. And this is where we get the first time that Miss Fortune tells Lux, my name's Sarah. You can call me Sarah. And it's like, I thought Sarah was for friends. And the, the, with that statement, Miss Fortune, who had been playing on her phone for most of this time, gets a text message on her phone, but deliberately puts it away in her pocket to have a conversation with Lux. And it is, I came in here to apologize because you looked, you know, really freaked out there. Because again, when you have anxiety and people are destroying your house, I doubt you're wearing a poker face at that point. <laughs> yeah. And if you think about it, it's, it's one of those cases where nothing that went wrong was ever, and this is consistent, is nothing that went wrong was Lux's fault, right? Uh, because MF was po poking the bear from the moment she came in. When Jinx came in, it was just more oil on the fire. Um, Ezreal got too into the whole dare thing. And then even with like the Lulu thing, right? Giving her that super high number that probably just amped up the magic cantation. Who knows? But she recognizes that. And she actually asked her, hey, do you mind if we stick around? Like, we don't want to go. We want to hang out with you guys. Ezreal's kind of upset because he thinks, you know, he messed up things, so he went ahead and ordered pizza. And Soraka's having a great time. Like at, Towards the end of this story, we see her being more talkative and involved. And from previously, you, you would never expect that from her character. Like She's having a good time as well. So it's working out. Can we stay? Yeah. And that kind of shocks her. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, Lux wants them to stay. And we get, we also get like, you know, a nice thing here because Miss Fortune hits a point where she starts rambling. Yeah. And so then it's like, you know, Lux, you're not, you're not crazy, Lux. You're, you're not crazy. You're just riding those emotions very hard. You're just human. But, but you're just human. You we don't you're, know. We still don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I can't wait for the reveal that they're just, none of them are human. Uh, they're all androids. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, it's like, it's like, Lux, you're not as crazy as you think you are. But like the big thing of Miss Fortune's apology here is that she wanted Lux to know that she would never hurt another Star Guardian. Yeah. So it's like, I had no intention of blowing your head off, despite having you stare down the barrel of my gun and s telling you it's time to say goodbye. Um, <laughs> it's called a misunderstanding. It happens. <laughs> Yeah, so the you know we get this nice thing, scene of just like okay, look, it's not as it's not as bad as you thought it was, Lux. They do want to stay and be friends, and Lulu comes in carrying a bunch of onesies. Yeah, and is like, hey, come on, let's go put these on. Handmade, and handmade onesies, yeah, handmade. and Lulu's like, these are for you. Let's go fun, have fun, and. Miss Fortune looks at Lux and is like, yeah, we're definitely going to stay because I want to see what Ezra looks like with braided hair. <laughs> and <laughs> Which, we're we, we can finally enjoy our sleepover. <laughs> yeah. And we won't get into cultural appropriation and why they should not braid Ezreal's hair. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> my <joking>. Lord, <laughs> <laughs> you're on our radar, right? Uh, we're, we're watching you. <laughs> Hang, hang on a second. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna push like my metaphorical glasses up on my uh -huh. brow. Well, actually, um, if we look at Ezreal's skin, skin complexion and eye color, he could be of Slavic descent. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get canceled. We're gonna get canceled over the slumber party episode. I know, right? But yeah, that's the episode. Um, that's the story as well, right? It kind of wraps up there. And this, this is a nice fun kind of break in things because it, it's going to get serious past this point. Cause we're gonna start to get like, <laughs> if you thought we were getting content now, this is all just the intro. <laughs> yeah, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but that's why we wanted to try to touch on this really quick. Uh, with really the quick, bios. quote unquote. <laughs> well, I, I mean, <laughs> This is a longer episode, but we talked about the bios of five members on top of it. Yeah. So in, in in the big scheme of things, we touched on it quickly. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we're we not going to put out a short episode. We don't do that here. We, we go hard. 
<laughs> so with that, um, if you've stuck around this long, there will be a part four, and it will be coming very soon. So make sure you hurry up and listen to this one, which is me telling you at the end of the episode. But as always, thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with the next Star Guardian episode. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.